Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Ethics Fundamental Series. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Helen Eisner and Kim Sikora Panza from our General Counsel's Office, and they're going to be talking about an issue that has been described in the past as difficult, nettlesome, and other words that I can't really put uh, out here on uh, the public uh, airwaves. So. Uh, what what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Kim and Helen in just a minute, but uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, if you miss this broadcast today or if you have some colleagues who you think would benefit from uh, being able to listen to this broadcast, remember that this video and other ones that we have are all archived on our Google Plus page and on YouTube. Uh, I also urge you to check out the IEG store for all kinds of useful job aids from both OGE and from the ethics community. And lastly, I'd like to remind you that next Thursday at noon, we're going to be doing our advanced practitioner, and we're going to be, going to be covering 205A with uh, Rachel Dowell and Lee Francis from uh, also the General Counsel's Office. So that's going to be a really good presentation that I think that you should uh, make an effort to uh, join us online for. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim and to Helen. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Well, uh, thank you, Ryan, and good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to today's Institute for Ethics in Government Fundamental Series on Making Sense of Particular Matters. Uh, as Ryan said, I'm Helen Eisner, and I'm an assistant counsel here in the Ethics Law and Policy Branch, and I'm Kim Sakura Panza, and I am also an assistant counsel in the Ethics Law and Policy Branch. We're really excited to be here today. We are excited to share some of our research into the particular matter concept and hopefully shed some light on um, some of the issues that come up when you are struggling with a particular matter determination. So we have a PowerPoint that we're going to put up on the screen during the presentation that will allow you to follow along um, at your offices while we go through. So I think Ryan's gonna put that up now and we'll get started. Great, well, um, as Ryan mentioned, the concept of uh, particular matter is really a, a central one to our ethics rules and criminal conflict of interest laws. But a whole host of confusion comes along with these two simple words, particular matter. And in this presentation, we hope to break things down a bit and provide some basic guidance for you as an ethics official on how to apply this concept um, on a daily basis. Also, uh, before we start, we, we just wanted to draw your attention to one of our legal advisories, which is 06X029. And this is always uh, a really helpful resource when confronting these issues, and we encourage you to reference back to this resource in the future. So in terms of the presentation today, the first thing that we're going to discuss is just the particular matter concept in general and try to provide some information and context that will be helpful to help try and understand what the term means. As part of that discussion, we're going to discuss both sorts of particular matters. We have particular matters involving specific parties and particular matters of general applicability. Most of our time is going to be spent talking about that latter concept, particular matters of general applicability. And the reason why is because it's usually easy to spot particular matters that involve specific parties, but can be much trickier when you're trying to identify a particular matter of general applicability. And of course, we're going to talk about broad matters as well, um, because that's the broader universe of government activity, which um, it's not narrow or focused enough to be a particular matter. And after we go through the basic concepts, we're going to have a discussion about various criminal conflict of interest statutes and our standards of conduct provisions that use these terms. And we're going to provide some examples of how the particular matter analysis has been done in some real cases. So matters, particular matters of general applicability, and particular matters involving specific parties. You've all seen these terms, but what do they mean? Okay, so first we're going to talk about some basic nuts and bolts. Um, as you all know, there are three categories of matters that the criminal con conflict of interest statutes and the standards of conduct contemplate that a federal employee might be involved with. They're displayed up on the screen in a bullseye. We have matters, particular matters of general applicability, and particular matters involving specific parties. This bullseye that you see up on your screen is going to be one that we'll have throughout the presentation to show the different categories. When we move through, we're going to try and highlight the band we're talking about in blue so you can get a visual sense of where we are. 
first off, we have matters. That's the outer band we have highlighted in light blue here. So what does this really mean? We have up on the screen really broad matters, matters that focus on a large and diverse group. Some examples from our regulations include deliberations of an advisory panel on federal tax reform or regulations that change the method of calculating depreciation. When we move in on our inner circle, we get to the particular matter category. Now, if you see here, we've highlighted the two inner bands, particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. Our regulations um, say that a particular matter is one that involves deliberation, decision, action that's focused on the interest of specific persons or a discrete and identifiable class of persons. Now, that definition is a little bit dense, but it's exactly why we have both of those bands highlighted right now. It tells us a couple important things. First, we know that a particular matter doesn't necessarily need to involve parties, and also that it's not limited to adversarial proceedings or formal relationships. So that's why under this umbrella we have our two buckets, particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. Now, first, we're going to look at particular matters of general applicability. Now, interestingly, or perhaps frustratingly, uh, this term, particular matter of general applicability, does not itself appear in the criminal conflict of interest laws. It's a term that OGE created in our regulations to define the other particular matter category that's used in the statutory language. Now, we acknowledge that the term is a mouthful and somewhat confusing. You don't normally have the word particular and general in the same term of art. And we certainly acknowledge that it's not necessarily intuitive or accessible for you as ethics officials to use in counseling and advising employees. But it's what we have, and we're going to hopefully give you some context to understand the concept. A particular matter of general applicability typically involves deliberations, decisions, or actions that focus on a particular industry or profession, such as regulations, programs or standards, and policy making, as long as it's focused on a discrete and identifiable class. What it really means is what we have up there, narrower matters that are focused on a discrete and identifiable class of persons. Some examples from our regulations include regulations that establish safety standards for trucks on interstate highways, or determinations or legislation focused on the compensation and the working conditions of a class of assistant United States attorneys. Next in the band, we have the center concept, particular matters involving specific parties. A particular matter involving specific parties typically includes specific proceedings that affect the legal rights of some parties. So think about something like a judicial proceeding, a hearing, or an enforcement action. The particular matter involving specific parties also can include isolatable transactions or a related set of transactions that include identified parties. So here, think about something like contract, license, grants, product approvals, or applications. What does this really mean? We have up on the screen, a very limited group of identified parties is involved in the matter. Some examples also taken from our regulations. Uh, the FTC review of a proposed merger between two companies or an FDA approval of a certain drug company's application. So before we move on to our next session, I wanted to just chat briefly about the circular graphic that we've been using. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the inverted triangle diagram that OGE has used in its training materials. And the new graphic that we're using today, the bullseye, communicates the same information. One advantage of this graphic and the reason why we're using it today is that it visually shows you how a larger category also includes smaller categories. So for example, what does this mean? If you have a regulation that prohibits an employee's involvement with any matter, the broadest category, so that might be some of the 207 restrictions on senior employees, that means that that employee cannot work on a matter or any of the interior bands of the circle, um, particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. It subsumes the whole group. 
Now, by contrast, if you have a law or regulation that uses the term particular matter, that means that you're covering the two smaller circles that you see circled up here in red, particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. So both the circle and the triangle um, are this, the same information, and please use whichever uh, visual representation you think is more helpful. So we'll get more into the specifics about these terms in just a minute, but it's really important to stress the reason we care about these terms and the distinctions between them. And that's because they determine the scope of the relevant prohibitions and exemptions. So uh, this so what slide, as uh, Roy Lichtenstein put it, is um, it's here to show you that the type of matter um, really determines your employee's uh, potential liability. So when an employee comes to you, you always have to think about what type of matter is involved and the type of matter um, is really important as far as what activities the employee can participate in um, in order to serve your agency's mission. So this so what is really critical as far as understanding the type of matter. So the key threshold question for any ethics analysis is always what type of matter is involved. Um, so on that note, uh, let's break it down so it's clear in what circumstances the criminal statutes and um, our rules under the standards of conduct appear. And we're gonna go through and um, list uh, where matters, particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties appear both in the criminal statutes, criminal conflict of interest statutes, and in the standards of conduct. And we're combining that here just as uh, an illustration um, not in any way to um, you know, combine or equate the criminal conflict of interest statutes and our standards of conduct as for, far as potential liability. Um, but let's start with matter and just you know, go through where this appears. So, and again, before I start, um, just so you can uh, uh, follow along with me, we're referring to the areas in the bullseye so you can see, um, as we're talking about matters, particular matters of general applicability, and particular matters involving specific parties, what areas are covered um, by the um, parts of the bullseye that we've highlighted in blue. So again, starting with matters. Matters are the outer band of the bullseye. But when a matter is involved, it triggers the entire bullseye. So again, the area triggered when we shade, when, is the area that we've shaded in blue, which encompasses both matters, particular matters of general applicability, and particular matters involving specific parties. So where does matter appear? Matter terminology is found in 207C and D, which are the restrictions for senior and very senior employees from coming back and working on matters. And also uh, in the teaching, speaking, and writing limitations under the standards of conduct, in uh, 807. Now moving on to particular matter, as you can see on the screen. Now particular matter encompasses particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. So again, this is the two inner circles of our bullseye. And particular matter terminology is found at 203, 205, 208, and 502A2, and also under subpart F. Now moving on um, to particular matters involving specific parties and where that can be found. And th again, this is our narrowest category and it just covers the very center of the bullseye. And this can be found at, at under 207A, 205C, and 203C, which are the SGE restrictions for special government employees. Also for under uh, the standards of conduct at 502, 503, and um, it's also seen in uh, various 208 regulatory exemptions. So a little bit later in the presentation, we'll talk more about how the analysis has been done in some specific contexts. But let's understand a little bit about, um, you know, kind of why this is important and why the term exists. And it's really not just an exercise in semantics to figure out whether something fits in one category or the next. If ethics officials and employees fail to understand and appreciate the distinction between the different categories, this can lead to inadvertent violations of the law. Applying the categories incorrectly can leave employees in hot water. For example, 208 generally refers to particular matters. So it applies to the broader range of activities 
or a broader range of activities than party matters. But if an employee is advised incorrectly that Section 208 applies only to particular matters that focus on a specific party or company, and the employee thinks that he, can, he or she can only avoid uh, participating in things like enforcement actions or contracts, and you know, the employee thinks that um, they, that's the kind of limited category of activities they have to avoid, then the employee may inadvertently violate the law by participating in other particular matters like rulemaking uh, that might affect a specific person or company as part of a class. So again, just going back to our, our so what point that I mentioned earlier, the point is that this matters for your analysis. Identifying the type of matter determines the employee's participation and it really serves the goals of your agency to be able to determine the matter and determine what the employee can participate in. So now moving on, let's look specifically at the particular matter category. So why do we even have this concept of particular matter? Well, understanding this category is really important um, because the upper and lower boundaries of government activities that affect a discrete and identifiable class or party can move an employee in one direction or the other direction towards a specific party matter or the broader matter category. So let's understand why this middle uh, ground category exists and um, the differences between specific party matters and broader matters. So originally, the criminal statutes were largely focused on claims before the government. This category of particular matter was created to broaden the scope of the criminal statutes by making them applicable to all the activities of modern government, not just claims. At the same time, it was recognized we couldn't hamper modern government by prohibiting involvement in broad general areas of activity. So some people criticize this middle area, uh, particularly when it comes to Section 208, which is our um, criminal conflict of interest prohibition, prohibition. And some people suggest that the restriction should only apply to particular matters involving um, specific parties. And we're, we're talking again about 208 and um, when uh, we're talking about the post-employment restrictions under 207, this is a prohibition that does in fact only apply to particular matters involving specific parties. But from our perspective, an employee's participation in a party matter in which he has a financial interest usually would raise real conflicts of interest, but still, we also think this middle category is important. The category of particular matters involving, uh, sorry, particular matters of general applicability. And it's this kind of participation in a broader universe of matters that can really still sometimes pose a significant conflict of interest. Okay, so what is a particular matter of general applicability? Um, as we know, it's the highlighted you know, second circle of our bullseye and one of the components of the particular matter designation. OGE defines what a particular matter of general applicability is in its regulations at 5 CFR 2640.102M. And there we say that a particular matter of general applicability means a particular matter that is focused on a discrete and identifiable class of persons, but does not involve specific parties. So breaking it down, what are the components of this definition? First component is we have a discrete and identifiable class. Now, what does that mean? That's a group of persons who have a shared characteristic or trait that makes them distinguishable from the general population. So some examples that we've given have been veterans, meat packers, the mining industry. Now the second component of the definition is also equally important, and it's that the matter is focused. That means that it's directed to the class that we've talked about, or that it will have a distinct impact on the class, not just as a member of the general public or as part of the entire business community. So, so that's the definition of the components, but what are some examples? 
Regulation drafting is usually a quintessential example that often comes up when trying to give an illustration of a particular matter of general applicability. And the reason why is because in many cases, regulations are focused on a discrete and identifiable class of persons. For example, think about a regulation that implements portions of a healthcare bill that regulates the prices charged for prescription drugs. OGE's regulations tell us that this is a rulemaking example that qualifies as a particular matter of general applicability. There, the discrete and identifiable class is pharmaceutical companies, the ones that determine the prices of the drugs. And you can say that the regulation is focused on the interest and activities of these companies in a way that's narrower than the general public or the entire business community. So you can see how that example meets the two prongs of the components up on the screen. Now, by contrast, let's say we have a broader regulation that isn't directed to a small group, but instead to the interest of a large and diverse group of people. That is not going to be a particular matter. Piggybacking on the example above, OGE has said that a legislative proposal for broad health care reform is not a particular matter because it's not focused on the interest of specific persons or a discrete and identifiable class. Instead, you see that a broad health care reform is targeted towards and intended to affect every single person in the United States. So how do you decide when you have a class of affected people and whether they're so large that they're no longer a discrete and identifiable class? That is the million dollar question, and it's one that several panelists, including OGE's general counsel, grappled with at the recent Government Ethics Summit. Not to disappoint anyone, but I don't think that there is a definitive answer to this question. And this, the reason why is because in all cases, it's ultimately a judgment call that you as ethics officials must make. That being said, there are a couple of points that we think are helpful to keep in mind as you grapple with these issues on a daily basis. First, keep in mind what Helen mentioned earlier about the historical background about where the particular matter term comes from. We want ethics rules to apply to more than narrow claims, but we have the word particular to modify matter to make clear that the restrictions on federal employees don't apply to general areas of activity. Instead, we have restrictions related to particular matters which encompass party matters and those that are focused on the interest of a discrete and identifiable class. Now, there is an unpublished OLC opinion from August of 1990 that uh, we think has some really informative language that reminds us of, you know, this, this word particular is a really important one um, and it's there for a reason. Um, the way this opinion did it is it reminded us that if we define the term particular matter really broadly, that means that just about any activity, no matter how general, could be prohibited. And the opinion was nice because it gave some um, admittedly pretty absurd examples that show the implications of if you were to take too broad of a view of particular matter. So one example is that it said that if the president asked the Secretary of Defense who owned one share of a stock in a single United States company, whether he thought the United States should get tough on Iraq, the secretary arguably couldn't respond without a potential violation of Section 208, the criminal conflict of interest laws. Um, similarly, a Secretary of Treasury, in all likelihood, couldn't participate in discussions about the size of the federal budget deficit, again, a very broad discussion, with, uh, without committing a potential 208 violation. That would be the consequence of taking an unnecessarily broad view of a particular matter. So if we apply that logic to the two healthcare examples above, if you looked at healthcare legislation, broad, comprehensive healthcare legislation, and said that was a particular matter, that essentially would destroy the meaning of the word particular and be completely against the concept that we don't want to restrict federal employees from general areas of activity. But the pharmaceutical pricing regulation looks a little bit differently. And why is that? Because when we look at the regulations about pharmaceutical prices and what uh, prices can be charged, 
That is not a general area like comprehensive health care legislation. Instead, it's targeted, it's focused, and it's focused on the pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical companies. So one other point to keep in mind when you consider whether something is a particular matter, if you have something that's a group or a class that looks a lot like the general public, you're probably not going to find that group to be a discrete and identifiable class. So for example, if we had a class that consisted of all business enterprises in the United States, that wouldn't be a discrete and identifiable class because it's a hugely broad and diverse group. And this is probably also the case if you have a regulation that affected all businesses that employed more than 10 people, because again, that is a large and diverse class. But what if we had something narrower? say, a class consisting of all business enterprises that sell pet accessories, like these adorable pooches you see up on your screen. That would be a discrete and identifiable class because that group is narrow and it shares certain defined characteristics. Pet accessories, admittedly, is a pretty silly example and probably is not one that comes up in your daily practice. But we wanted to give you um, this somewhat memorable example to illustrate how you can look at a certain industry or subset of businesses as a discrete and identifiable class. And the regulations um, that OGE have, um, they're chock full of other examples where we talk about how specific professions or groups constitute a discrete and identifiable class. And some of those uh, less colorful examples are the meatpacking industry, prescription drug or pharmaceutical companies, domestic companies that sell portable computers, the mining industry, organizations producing science education programs for elementary school children. So those are other examples that illustrate how we look at a, a defined group in that way. Now there's often a line drawing exercise that is involved in making these distinctions. You have some flexibility to make these determinations and it's just important to keep in mind the critical question of whether you have a discrete and identifiable class that shares certain defined characteristics. So what would be some other examples of a particular matter of general applicability? I would say one would be if a Department of Agriculture employee is working on a proposal to purchase grain from domestic farmers uh, to help support grain prices. That project uh, proposal to purchase grain from domestic farmers would seem to be a particular matter because grain farmers are a discrete and identifiable class and the project focuses on that particular industry. Let's consider another hypothetical situation. What if you have an employee at the Postal Rate Commission and she's asked to participate in a working group that's considering raising the postal rate for first class stamps? Now, we say that this arguably would not be a particular matter because the issue that the working group is focused on is directed at a large and diverse group of people. The general public that uses first class stamps is a very broad group. So there you don't have a discrete and identifiable class that's the focus of the activity and therefore wouldn't find that that activity would be a particular matter. Uh, so to, to help you as you're approaching these often uh, complicated questions, we've put together a roadmap for analysis for identifying particular matters of general applicability. So let's first look at a few key questions that might help you when you're trying to determine whether a given matter is a particular matter of general applicability. So first, uh, you should ask yourself, how broad or narrow is the focus of the matter? consider whether the matter is directed to a group of individuals or entities. Next, it's important to think about whether the class that the matter focuses on is discrete and identifiable from the general population. Now remember, a class is not discrete and identifiable simply because it is the focus of the matter. There must be an independent reason the class is discrete and identifiable and such as, you know, the class encompasses a particular industry, profession, or economic sector. Another question to ask yourself, does the matter have a distinct impact on a class that is separate from the impact of the matter on the general population? The discrete and identifiable class that is the focus of a particular matter generally is impacted in a way that is distinct 
from the impact on the general population. Now remember, a matter may still be a particular matter even if it has an impact beyond the class with which it is concerned. For example, regulations establishing safety standards for the trucking industry would be a particular matter because they relate to a particular distinct group even though broader public safety concerns likely motivated the rules. And as we know from uh, our, our lovely bullseye, which we're gonna, keep, we're gonna keep throwing at you, so get used to this bullseye, uh, particular matters of general applicability are the middle band of, the, of types of matters that a federal employee might encounter. But we also have the broader, more general matters and the subset of particular matters, which is particular matters involving specific parties. So let's also take a look at these two categories as, as far as how to approach and identify them. For particular matters involving specific parties, as we talked about before, this is the narrowest of the terms. And as we mentioned, um, when this terms appears, and we'll talk about this a little bit later as far as how it's been applied in the past, but it's important to keep in mind what, that when this term is used in the criminal conflict of interest statutes or the standards of conduct, it is because of a deliberate decision to impose a more limited ban and to narrow the circumstances, circumstances in which the ban is to operate. So for this reason, we have said that a particular matter involving specific parties typically involves a specific proceeding affecting the legal rights of the parties or an isolatable transaction or related set of transactions between identified parties. Now, as we talked about before, general examples of this are contracts, grants, licenses, uh, product approval applications. But generally speaking, rulemaking and legislation are not covered by this category unless in the unique circumstance that they are narrowly focused on identified parties, uh, such as, for example, a, a private relief bill. Now, um, moving on to matters, as we stated before, um, we think you should really start to think of this as really broad matters. Uh, now, now matters, you can't say that they're focused on a particular group or class um, or that they're directed to the interests of a, a large and um, diverse group of persons. So they have an impact on the general population. Uh, this is the really broad group of matters. And we give you various examples of this earlier um, that we discussed and uh, these matters that would not constitute a particular matter. So what does it all really mean? Let's see uh, how particular matter terminology has been applied and I want to spend some time focusing even more on some good examples of particular matter terminology as interpreted by OLC opinions and OGE advisories. And these are really our, our best guideposts when it comes to understanding these terms. So I'm going to discuss some specific examples for how a particular matter terminology has been applied in the context of 18 U.S.C. 208, uh, our impartiality provision under the standards of conduct, 502, uh, 18 U.S.C. 205, dealing with representational activity, and 18 U.S.C. 207, our post-employment restriction. So let's start with, uh, of with 208. But before I jump fully into the 208 world, I want to point out an example that we often bounce around here at OGE, and this is the classic aspirin example. Now, this is something that appeared in a somewhat muddled fashion in a 1978 OLC opinion, but can really help explain the application of particular matter terminology in the 208 context, and also demonstrate some common pitfalls. So let's take a regulation concerning the production standards for aspirin. How do we think about this under 208? So looking at our screen, immediate reaction. Uh, my employee just goes to CVS and buys aspirin when he has a headache. There's no way this is a particular matter to him. Now it's certainly true that the financial impact on the employee is very likely determinative um, as part of the analysis. But a point I really want to emphasize is don't just jump to direct and predictable. What we're talking about here is whether there's a particular matter 
in the first place. A matter isn't a particular matter to the employee. It is either a particular matter or not, independent of the employee. With all due respect to our poor employee with his headache, and perhaps even some ethics officials who themselves have a headache trying to understand particular matter terminology, the particular matter analysis stands alone. And what I mean by that is there's a tendency to jump to direct and predictable, but 208 is critically a two-prong analysis. Is it a particular matter? A matter is particular or not independent of the employee. Once you have the answer to that question of whether it's a particular matter, then of course it's important to conduct the rest of the analysis to figure out if there is a 208 issue. So if you first find a particular matter, you then also determine if there is a direct and predictable effect on the employee's financial interest. So first, is our aspirin regulation a particular matter of general applicability? Yes, there is a focus on a discrete and identifiable class of aspirin producers. Of course, this is not the end of the 208 analysis. It may, and here it will likely fail the second prong of direct and predictable effect on a financial interest, meaning that the employee, employee can likely participate. But the point I want to make is not to conflate the two parts of the analysis, whether there is a particular matter and whether the identified particular matter has a direct and predictable effect on the employee's financial interest are separate considerations. Now, changing the hypothetical again to demonstrate that particular matter identification is at least mechanically a completely independ independent part of the 208 analysis. Let's again go back to our, our poor employee with the headache. But this time, he owns $100,000 in Bayer stock. However, his job involves working on healthcare legislation, not on the aspirin regulation we discussed before. Starting with prong one, is it a particular matter of general applicability for 208 purposes? As we've said, healthcare legislation does not focus on a discrete and identifiable class. So there is no 208 problem, and he can go ahead um, and uh, participate in the work on the legislation, even if he owns the Bayer stock, um, and even in this case where the direct and predictable element seems stronger. This raises an important point. You can see how healthcare legislation would have many component parts some of which may directly impact aspirin manufacturers. It is generally not required to break down broad matters into smaller components that may be considered particular matters when doing an analysis to see if something involves a particular matter. And as we said in one of our legal advisories, 05X1, um, where we address deliberations of the President's Advisory Panel on Federal Tax Reform, we explained uh, that broad public policy matters should not usually be carved up into successively finer and more focused parts. In the advisory, we say, it would not be logical to conclude that an employee could participate in considering the overall legislative proposal, but not its constituent parts. Um, I'm going to talk about another uh, 208 example, which uh, Again, if we have up on the screen, we have our bullseye, showing that 208 covers particular matters, meaning both particular matters of general applicability, as well as particular matters involving specific parties. So we have those two inner bands highlighted in blue. So the first example that I wanted to talk about was um, one that was discussed in a 1993 unpublished OLC opinion that addressed the activities of something called the Federal Open Market Committee. Now that's a committee that regulates interest rate sensitive securities mainly by uh, manipulating the amount of reserves that are available to banks and to thrift institutions. The question that that opinion looked at was were the activities of the committee particular matters of general applicability? Now, the opinion went through, and as part of its analysis, um, it compared this situation of the Federal Open Market Committee to an earlier 
OLC decision where they considered whether recommendations of the President's Council of Economic Advisors constituted particular matters. In the earlier decision, OLC concluded that the activities of the President's Council were matters, not particular matters, because they were addressed to general policies for economic growth and stability. Now, the Federal Open Market Committee situation was different in OLC's opinion. The reason why is because the Federal Open Market Committee's policies were directed to a particular aspect of economic policy and a particular segment of the economy, banks and thrifts. Therefore, OLC concluded that um, the decisions that the committee made related to a particular and discrete group, the banking industry. Now, that was the case even though the work of the committee could potentially have various effects on the economy as a whole. Now, I want to take a second to explicitly acknowledge something. Earlier when I talked about the OLC's analysis, um, trying to figure out if this committee uh, work involved a particular matter, uh, I jumped around and compared it to a situation where the OLC determined that something was a matter. Now, neither I nor the OLC do this sort of jumping around just to confuse and frustrate you. The reason why we compare and contrast against examples that might be in a different category is because we think that it's helpful when you're trying to figure out which, um, which bucket something, some activity falls in, it's helpful to compare and contrast not only against other examples that you have in the same category, so here comparing against other particular matters of general applicability examples, but also other examples in the bordering categories, because that helps you figure out how you can properly classify your case, what your situation is closest to. Um, going back to the, the Federal Open Market Committee um, case, it raises two other important points that I just wanted to highlight again. Now, first, as we talked about earlier, just because something might have an impact outside of the discrete and identifiable class that makes it a particular matter, that doesn't mean that we're taken out of particular matter of general applicability territory. So here, like I said, OLC said the committee's decisions might have effects on the economy, but because the committee's decisions were focused specifically on banks and thrifts, we had a discrete and identifiable class, and therefore a particular matter. Um, the example is also a nice reminder about how we can think about the particular matter concept. Uh, we often think about a class as an industry group or certain professionals, such as truck drivers or Helen's aspirin producers. But professionals aren't the only types of groups that, that we might be able to identify. As we talked about earlier in the roadmap, the task is to figure out whether the focus of the activities is on a group that's discrete and identifiable from the general population. And here, OLC concluded that banks and thrifts were discrete and identifiable. So let's take on another 208 related OLC opinion um, that I think is a good point of contrast to this Federal Open Market Committee example. In an August 1990 opinion, OLC questioned whether deliberations regarding a response to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait were particular matters. So <clears throat> let's think about this compared to the banks and thrift situation. We need to figure out, are the deliberations focused on a discrete and identifiable group? Will the deliberations have a distinct impact on a discrete and identifiable class? OLC concluded that the deliberations would affect virtually every economic sector and individual, and that the effect would not be distinctive on any individual or group or sector. So what we're talking about in this Kuwait situation is a decision that focused really on the entire population and the entire economy. So what are we, what are we looking at? Um, we're looking at a situation that falls outside 208 category, or 208 territory in our bullseye. Now, in contrast, in this opinion, OLC said, if the discussion was on whether to seize a particular oil field or tanker, then the actions would, in fact, focus on specific individuals or entities or on a discrete and identifiable class, and that would bring us back into the blue shaded area of the circle because we would be in the inner two rings. Now, this is important because 
As we talked about earlier, if 208 covered broad deliberations, it could really cripple the entire government. No one would be able to work on foreign policy strategy because almost everyone would surely have some sort of financial interest tied to that strategy. Now, 208, as, as Helen talked about earlier, was really meant to reach true conflict of interest concerns. So we recognize that the concerns aren't limited just to cases or controversies or party matters, but we have a limiting a limiting effect by using particular to create a practical standard to really um, find activities that pose a potential conflict. Before we move on to another, um, another area, I wanted to leave a few final 208 thoughts. First, even if you look at a class, let's say you look at a class and determine that it's discrete and identifiable. As Helen said, remember this is just the first part of the analysis. As discussed above, particular matter is the first part of the discussion and it doesn't mean that an employee cannot work on a matter if you find that there is a particular matter. Once you determine that something is a particular matter, you then proceed with the analysis to see if there is a direct and predictable effect on the employee's financial interest such that he or she should not work on that activity. If you have something that has an effect on a large number of groups, it's going to be pretty likely that you will not satisfy the direct and predictable analysis. And this is something that OGE acknowledges explicitly in our 208 regulation. Um, in 2640.103, we say that a particular matter that has an effect on a financial interest only as a consequence of its effect on the general economy does not have a direct effect within the meaning of this part. So, so what does that mean? Let's look at our open market, Federal Open Market Committee example again. We've said that that's a particular matter, but do we have a 208 disqualification? It depends. If you apply the direct and predictable test, it seems that someone working on the committee couldn't own interest rate sensitive securities because decisions of the committee have a direct and predictable effect on those interests. But if you had a person that had other financial interest that were only potentially affected as a result of the impact of the committee's decisions on the economy as a whole, that person would not be disqualified from participating under 208. Our point here today isn't to get into direct and predictable, but to emphasize that particular matter and direct and predictable work in tandem. And just because the particular matter standard is met doesn't mean that you're going to have a 208 violation. It just means that you've met the first threshold step and that you need to proceed with your analysis. The second point that I wanted to touch on is that <clears throat> um, the relationship with the standards of conduct provision 5 CFR part 2635 502. That's the impartiality provision. Now that provision's narrower in that it only covers specific party matters and that's one area of the bullseye, the center circle. So if we go back to our aspirin example, a regulation affecting aspirin, as we've discussed, falls into the particular matter of general applicability category. So it wouldn't directly fall into 502 because it's not a particular matter involving specific parties. But if we had a situation where our employee with the headache was engaged in a product review specific to Bayer, then that would be a particular matter involving specific parties it would be in the center part of the circle and trigger both 502 and 208. I just mentioned this because it shows that 502 is narrower by design in terms of the reach of the prohibition and the types of covered relationships. So I also just want to jump in and, and provide a few more examples that discuss 18 U.S.C. 205 and 207 and uh, just help cover all our bases as far as how particular matter terminology has been applied. Um, so let's quickly look at 18 U.S.C. 205, the prohibition against acting as agent or attorney. The statute applies to covered matters, which encompasses both particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. So again, those two inner rings of the circle, and this is the same area of activity covered under 208. Uh, in 1994, OLC uh, published an opinion that many of you may be familiar with and the question arose whether a federal employee could represent 
the National Association of Assistant United States Attorneys before the Department of Justice on personnel matters. OLC reasoned that discussion of personnel matters affecting AUSAs was a particular matter of general applicability. AUSAs were considered a discrete and identifiable class by virtue of their employing agency, their profession, and their position. This meant that current federal employees could not represent the National Association of Assistant U.S. Attorneys before the Department of Justice without violating 205. It's also a great example of the scope of 205. Looking again at our bullseye, 205 does not just cover specific parties ma party matters, it was meant to cover the wider area of particular matters of general applicability and particular matters involving specific parties. Clearly, the personal ma personnel matters at issue would have had a distinct impact and were focused on AUSAs, a population discrete and identifiable from the general population and the current employee could not represent the association. Now, with the scope of 205 in mind and contrasting 205 with 18 U.S.C. 207, this is really kind of a good opportunity to look at these two statutes and emphasize why it's important to identify the right particular matter terminology. The type of communications affecting the AUSAs fell in the particular matter of general applicability category for our 205 analysis. But particular matter of general applicability is a category, that broader middle ring, that is not covered under 18 U.S.C. 207A. This only applies to party matters, the center of the bullseye. So as we've already mentioned, there is a reason for this narrowing. For example, we don't want an individual who worked at the IRS as a tax attorney to be prevented from ever working on tax policy on his departure. 207A therefore impacts a narrower class of government activities. Because of this, identifying and drawing lines for 207 can be very important. For example, if the AUSAs we just discussed left their government positions, they would be able to represent the association regarding the same personnel grievances they were prevented from working on um, while employed for the government. Those personnel issues were categorized as particular matters of general applicability, the middle category, but fall outside the narrowest category of particular matters involving specific parties. To provide one final and helpful, I think, example, and specifically shed light on 207A, the post-employment restrictions, let's talk about OGE Legal Advisory 80X10. In that advisory, we discuss a former attorney at the Department of Justice who was asked to advise a state attorney general's office on efforts to comply with federal guidelines regarding desegregation of state colleges and universities. Now, at the Department of Justice, he had worked on the development of court-ordered criteria by which six states were to develop plans to desegregate their higher education systems. Later on, he worked on the development of general criteria to be used as investigatory guidelines in states that formerly had dual systems of public higher education. The first set of criteria involving the six specific states were deemed to be a particular matter involving specific parties. And, and just to mention, none of these six states were the state where the former employee wanted to, to advise and, and provide guidance. So any later work related to um, this criteria regarding the six specific states would fall into 207A territory, meaning he could not work on it. However, um, there were no 207 problems related to the former employee's work advising a state on the second set of more general criteria. The general guidelines were not specific party matters. They did not apply to specific identified states, and the employee could work on these general criteria without violating 207, the post-employment restriction. Again, this case shows how identifying the right category determines whether the criminal statutes apply. Recognizing the difference between particular matters of general applicability, particular matters involving specific parties, and matters is just incredibly important um, to giving accurate ethics advice.
Now that we've discussed the different categories, one final subject we wanted to touch on briefly is transitions and how you determine how a government, when a government activity transitions from one category to the next. We acknowledge that the boundaries are fluid and fuzzy between the categories, and it can be frustrating to try and figure out where a specific project lies, particularly because work in the government isn't static. You need to do a case-by-case -case analysis to figure these things out. Um, and just in terms of some general guidance, if you're trying to figure out if a broad matter has become a particular matter, you would look at um, whether the deliberations have turned to specific actions that focus on certain people or a discrete and identifiable class of people. The example we talked about earlier about healthcare is a good one. A legislative plan for broad health care reform is not a particular matter, but a particular matter would arise if the agency later issued implementing regulations on pharmaceutical prices. If you're trying to figure out when a particular matter becomes one involving specific parties, the general rule is that specific parties are first identified when the government first receives an expression of interest from a prospective party, like a contractor or a grantee. Um, this isn't always timing dependent, and OGE has various legal advisories that discuss the nuances of when a particular matter involving specific parties arises. Um, ultimately, there are no hard and fast rules when you look at the boundaries in our bullseye, but hopefully this context helps you see how something can transition from a matter into the next band of particular matter of general applicability and finally, potentially to a particular matter involving specific parties, the center part of our bullseye. So uh, that concludes uh, today's fundamentals presentation. We really hope we've helped make sense of particular matters. And um, you know, our, your OG desk officers are always available to answer any questions that may come up. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. And I'd also like to just uh, remind everyone that next month, or I'm sorry, not next month, next week, uh, we're going to be doing our advanced practitioner. It's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be covering 205A. Uh, we're going to have two members of our general counsel's office here to do that uh, with us, and we look forward to seeing you there. So with that, I'm Ryan Segrist, and we'll see you next week.